So moving from human-powered energy to organic energy, we are, uh, we're delighted to have Dr. Curtis Burlingett. And uh, Curtis is based right here at the University of Calgary. He's an assistant, sorry, associate professor in chemistry, a fellow of the Institute of Sustainable Energy, Environment and Economy, or IC, and a director of the Center for Advanced Solar Materials at the U of C. So he is taking some very cool stuff about plants and organic activity and, and matter and turning it into energy. And we know that we are uh, definitely a center of, of oil and gas energy, but why can't Calgary be that center for all things energy? Yeah, we have a tremendous amount of sunlight that we have in our, in our city, in our province, a tremendous amount of wind. So why can't we think broader? Why can't we think differently about being a broader energy center? And so Curtis has taken that and is delving into what plants and, and, uh, and other organic matter can do to deliver on that form of energy. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Curtis Burlingham. Well, good morning. I'd just like to start off by thanking the organizers of this event for taking the initiative to, to put this together. I think it's, it's really a wonderful thing. But I look around and it's actually really, really trendy and hip. And as a chemistry professor, I don't often get invited to these sorts of things. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself and also about the research that we're doing here at the university. Um, but I'm going to start off with my what-if question. This is something I asked myself back in early of 2005. And that is, what if I could help solve the impending energy crisis? But I'd like to build up my story and, and uh, really what prompted me to ask that question. So I'm actually a native Calgarian. I'm one of the few people that live in Calgary that was raised in Calgary. And uh, I moved away when I was 17 years of age to northern Alberta to play junior hockey and, and then go to university. And I really had no clue what I wanted to do with my life until my third year of my undergraduate studies when I had this lab in inorganic chemistry on ferromagnetic nanoparticles. And I found it to be a, a really a amazing observation. And I started asking questions about how they, they really worked. And the TA wasn't able to give me very good answers, nor was my professor. And so I decided that I wanted to pursue a PhD in this particular area to try to provide some answers in this realm. So I went to my undergraduate advisor at the time and I told her I wanted to go into graduate school. And she's like, oh, Curtis, that's so nice you want to go get a PhD, but you know, why don't you stick to something you're good at, like hockey? You're not really cut out for research. I was like, wow, that was rather, rather deflating. But I was resolute and I really was not going to let her tell me what I could and could not do. And so I really geared down with my studies and I ended up with the highest grades in chemistry that particular year. And, and I went home that summer and I pulled up this brand new thing at the time called the World Wide Web. And, uh, and I learned how to get into graduate school. I called up the, the leader in molecular magnetism in the States and I convinced her after much persistence to take me on as a graduate student. And uh, I went down there and the average time it takes to get a PhD in her particular group was actually seven years. And I got mine in three and a half, but I wasn't cut out for research. So I then, I then went on to uh, Harvard University because it's much easier than the Iron Man competition. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I went there to carry out research in, in, uh, in bioinorganic chemistry. And I had enjoyed much more success in the lab, but at that point, I was being exposed to a, a number of different employment opportunities and, and really I wasn't thinking about academic research at that stage. I was flirting with careers in, in patent law, management consulting, going to Wall Street. Um, and in fact, you know, I, I, I made a commitment to a company. I, I signed on the dotted line and one day in March of 2005, I was walking from the chemistry department to the post office with my acceptance letter in hand to join this particular firm. But that day, I, I was walking past the physics department, and there was a seminar announcement called a global energy perspective. Now, this isn't something I normally do, but for some reason, there were some forces that drew me into that room. So I didn't make it to the post office at that particular point. I went in, and, and, I, and I took in this particular seminar. 
And it's when I left that seminar that I left with this question, and that is, what if I could help solve the impending energy crisis? And I'd like to summarize that particular seminar in, in two, I think, very important slides that really, really changed my life. Um, so in this seminar, the speaker was really breaking down how we as a global community, how much energy we use, and breaking it down in, in the terms of the various resources. And, um, and, and I learned that we as a global community are currently require about 15 terawatts of energy on a global scale. Okay, so that's 15 trillion joules every single second. And he provided a very compelling argument that our global energy demands will double by the mid-century point. So 15 terawatts to 30 terawatts. Now we know our CO2 levels are rising when we're meeting 12 terawatts of energy demands through the combustion of fossil fuels. And so this number really has to go down. That 12 terawatts has to go down to 10 terawatts if we're serious about really answering our carbon problems. Okay? And so simple arithmetic leaves us with 20 terawatts of energy that needs to be filled through alternative energy sources. All right? And this is a slide that really, really blew me away in this particular presentation. So the speaker broke down our energy mix with all of our, ener our alternative energy sources. And then he looked at the technical upper limit that we could produce with all of these energy sources. And so, for example, if you look at geothermal, you could poke all the holes you want in the earth, and the most energy you would be able to extract is 0.5 terawatts. We could dam up the rest of the rivers and streams in the world and maybe get another 0.9 terawatts. We can convert all of the arable land in the world to fuel crops and get maybe 5 to 7 terawatts. Okay, it's great, we'd be able to drive, but we wouldn't be able to eat. Um, nuclear power is actually one of the few alternative energy sources that actually scales to global energy demand. Okay, the problem here is, is that there are only 440 nuclear power plants working today. We would actually need to build about 10,000 by the year 2050 to actually meet that particular demand. And e even if we reached that particular point, we'd burn through all the uranium in a decade. So you look at all of these numbers and it, you realize it's going to be really difficult to fill this 20 terawatt gap. But then there's this one striking number here, and that is the amount of energy that's delivered to the Earth in the form of sunlight. Okay, the sun delivers energy at a rate of 120,000 terawatts. That's 120,000 trillion joules every single second. And you look at these numbers and you think there's only one real way we're going to solve this particular energy crisis. Here's a solar reality, as I call it. Uh, let's look at how much electricity is generated just in China, okay, by their coal-fired power plants. In 2006, they were generating 300 gigawatts of electricity through the combustion of, of these fossil fuels. In 2007, okay, there are a lot of media reports saying that China was building a new coal-fired power plant every single day. I don't know how accurate that particular analysis is, but I do know this. In 2007, they added 14 gigawatts to their base load. And you compare that to all of the electricity produced by all of the solar panels in the world today, 10 gigawatts. Okay. Right now, our solar industry is not able to keep up with the growth in one energy sector in one country. All right, this is a huge, huge challenge. And this is why, when I left that particular seminar, I did not make it to the post office. I went home, I did some reading. The next day, I went to my advisor and I said I wanted to go into academia because I really feel quite strongly about this problem. And he fully supported me. So here I was, a, a boy from Marlboro. I was doing some, my graduate work at Harvard. I was flirting with a a career with McKinsey, and I decided to return to my hometown to work on this problem to make it a better city. My wife was la laughing at me at the time. She said, wow, that's a, story that's, that's a story that could really make you mayor of the city at one point. And I was like, no, there's no way that background story would ever get anyone elected mayor in this city. <laughs> we'll have a little quiz about how well you know your mayor later. All right. <coughs> so, if we look at all of the different photovoltaic materials that are out there, I started analyzing what the problems are, what are the strengths. 
So right now, three quarters of the market share is made up of crystalline, multi-crystalline silicon. All right, but one of the elephants in the room with this particular technology is that there's a really high embodied energy. The amount of energy that goes into making these cells, you won't get that back when you install them in Calgary, you won't get that energy back for about a decade. A decade. So it really calls into question how green that particular technology is. Now, thin film technologies have made a significant market penetration in recent years. But one of the problems is, in my view, is that they rely on rare metals and they require, require very toxic metals. First Solar, based out of Ohio and the U.S., is currently the largest solar company in the world based on their market capitalization but they're pushing a technology based on cadmium. And I harbor serious reservations about covering the state of Arizona with a thin film of cadmium. All right. They keep telling me, well, don't worry, they're sealed. But there's so many unpredictable events that, that that really could draw that metal back into the ground soon. And so that's why myself and many others around the planet right now are working on developing advanced solar technologies. One of the things we're focused on is dye-sensitized solar cells. And this is really a breakdown of the DSC right here. Okay, what we do is we take a substrate. It can be plastic. It can be glass. We put a thin film of titania nanoparticles on that. Now, titania is the pigment in your paint at home that makes it white. Okay, all white paint has titania. That's what's giving it that white color. It's also in toothpaste. All right? So it's environmentally benign, and it's very cheap. It's dirt cheap, literally dirt cheap. Okay, the problem is, is that it's white in color, and if you heat it up, it actually turns transparent. So that's not very good if we're trying to build solar cells. And so what our group is doing is building molecules that we can stick to these nanoparticles that are very intensely colored. And when they absorb light, they inject this charge into the nanoparticles, and you have charge separation. You have a photovoltaic cell. All right, so. Some of the advantages of this is that we don't need to put these on glass. We can put them on flexible substrates. And as a result, one of the initial things that are being commercialized right now are these solar cells that are in, for example, backpacks. So then when you're walking to your office or to the lab, you can actually be recharging your laptop. One of the inherent problems with the dye-sensitized solar cell, however, is that none of these companies today are able to offer a warranty in excess of two years. Right, so that's why a lot of companies right now are starting to promote packaging their iPhones. Okay, so this is an iPhone case, but it actually contains a solar cell in there. So these solar cells actually work really well under low light intensity. So you can leave your phone on your desk, and it will actually recharge your phone. You'll never have to plug it into the wall again. All right, so this is, I think, really, really exciting for the field. But again, the reason I'm in this business is I want to solve this terawatt challenge. Okay, and generating a watt at best with these, with these cases is not going to get us all the way there. And so what our group has done in the last three years is that we've been able to develop components that don't compromise the efficiency of these cells, but are proving to be far more stable. Okay, and now my dream is to be able to incorporate these into windows my dream is to see a skyscraper in downtown Calgary, the south-facing wall, be covered entirely with these dye-sensitized solar cells. And now we have a huge electricity generation station. Okay, and the only way we're going to get there is by overcoming the stability issue. We're actually really good in terms of the efficiency. We're fine with that. And so we are currently working with a number of industry collaborators that, to really prove this, and including Sony Corporation. Now, that's only half the story. Okay, the other thing we have to address is how to store this solar energy. And my dream is to also see that our, our suburban houses to be completely removed from the grid. Okay, so we'll have our solar panels on the roof, and if you're at home, you can directly use that electricity. But the question becomes, what happens when you get, you know, at night or, you know, if you're at if you're at work during the day, you're not going to be able to use that electricity. So we have to find a way to store that, those electrons. And what we're, the best way to, the cleanest way to do that is really to electrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen fuel. Because then we're effectively storing that electrical energy in chemical bonds. Chemical bonds have a very high energy density. That's why fossil fuels are so much better than batteries, for example. Okay, but the problem is, is that all of the catalysts that have been known to date 
have really high over potentials. Okay, so you're going to lose a lot of the energy that goes into making those fuels. You'll never get it back. And it's also a very slow reaction, which makes it really, really expensive. And so our group is really focusing on trying to catalyze this particular reaction. We're making catalysts so we can go from a low energy substrate such as water to a higher energy substrate to make these hydrogen fuels. We're trying to store this energy in hydrogen. And so this is just a quick summary of what our accomplishments have been in the last three years. And I think this is very significant. This is a, a great thing for the University of Calgary. And, and, I, and I talk about this being me doing this, but this really comes down to the work of a single graduate student who comes from Calgary. He's a U of C graduate student. You know, and and he, was one of, he was in one of my, uh, my senior undergraduate courses. And I asked him what he wanted to do afterwards. And you know, he's like, I just want to be a ski bump for a couple of years. But I convinced him to actually come to grad school. And I said, you can, you can take the weekends off and go skiing, but you know, come do something with your life. And you know, it has been tremendously beneficial to, I think, this entire field that he chose to go to grad school. So what Derek has done is he's actually isolated 100 new catalysts in the last three years. And to put that in perspective, there were only six known water oxidation catalysts known in 2008. Thousands of researchers, 40 years of research. And Derek's come in and made 100 new catalysts. And as a result of his work, we now have the most active water oxidation catalysts in the world. Okay? Not only is it much, much faster than any of these other catalysts that the scientists are making, we're now 10 times faster than the LEAF. Okay? We're better than Mother Nature right now. Uh-oh. I need a solar panel. <laughs> That's why we don't like batteries. Okay, so I think this is a, a really exciting development going on here at the University of Calgary. And I want to leave with this particular question here. And that is, this is what I'm posing to you. What if Alberta was known globally as an energy innovator and not just an energy provider? I'm going to tell you two things that I'm currently working on to help put Calgary in particular on the map for this. Based on these water oxidation catalysts, a colleague, uh, Simone Trudell, in the Department of Chemistry and myself, have just started up a company. Um, we just incorporated a couple of months ago. We currently have the fastest water oxidation catalyst in the world. In the last two months, we've been able to wrangle up significant private investment to take this company to make this the next high-tech, clean-tech, baby for Canada. You will see a lot of this company in the coming months. This is, this is really exciting for us. And to help put UFC on the map, I looked around our campus and I identified a lot of people that are internationally recognized in this area that just aren't getting the recognition I think they deserve in the city. And so I've started up the Center for Advanced Solar Materials. These are with my colleagues here. And these guys are all trying to think of unique ways to convert sunlight into more useful forms of of energy. So I think I will finish off there and be glad to answer any questions after the break. Thank you.